Hello everyone and welcome to today's Asbestos Awareness Week webinar, Managing Asbestos in Workplaces. I'm Stephanie Murawski from WorkSafe Tasmania and I will be your moderator. Before we start, we ask that you take a moment to read the following slide about information received today. To interact in today's webinar, please use the question pane on your please use the questions window on your control panel to type and submit questions at any time during today's webinar. We will attempt to answer questions at the end of each presentation. Questions that we don't get to will be answered at the end of today's webinar. Presenter webcams will only be used and today's presentation is being recorded. To please refer also to your handouts pane in your control window uh, for any handouts too. It is now my pleasure to introduce your first presenter, SGC Safety's Matt Gamelik. Matt has extensive experience and qualifications working in the industrial sector and is the director of SGC Safety, a NATA accredited asbestos laboratory. Matt is also highly qualified and experienced as a registered nurse, occupational hygienist, educator, noise officer and ventilation officer. Matt's qualifications include hygiene and toxicology, postgrad from Edith Cowan University, certificate four in work health and safety, a certificate four in training and assessment, a paediatric intensive care postgraduate diploma, PMH and ECU, a bachelor degree in nursing and a certificate three, mines emergency response. Welcome Matt. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, just briefly, today I'll be covering what is asbestos, uh, where we can find it, how to identify it, and what to do if you come across asbestos. Just to start, um, asbestos is basically, oh, going too far. Uh, asbestos is basically a naturally occurring mineral. Um, two types, serpentine and amphibole, um, are the two most common, uh, Christol being the most commonly used. There's some pictures down there for you, that's a naturally occurring state. Um, three types of asbestos were used more commonly. We had Christol, which is the white asbestos. You find that mainly in asbestos cloth and cement products. Amosite, which is the brown asbestos, um, heat insulation and pipe lagging. And you've got your chrysidolite, which is your blue asbestos, um, very high temperature and acid resistant. Just mining of asbestos in Australia. Chrysidolite of the blue asbestos was mined in West Australia in Wittenoom, which we're probably all familiar with, from the 1930s until 1966. Um, less well known was the Woods Reef mine in uh, New South Wales, where they produced the white Christ tile asbestos. Uh, the mine was abandoned by its operators in the 1980s. Just a different mines there. Right, some not so fun facts about asbestos, but why it was used so commonly. Uh, the fibres are virtually indestructible. They're resistant to chemicals and heat and are very stable in the environment. Um, they don't evaporate into air or dissolve in water and are not broken down over time. So the things why it was used so often is what makes it bad now. Um, it's probably also known, the best known insulator to man. Um, just to get an indication of how small the fibres can be, uh, on the left hand side there you'll see two grains of rice. In the smaller circle that's 20,000 asbestos fibres. Um, the only way to really identify them is under microscope. Um, they can be up to 200 times thinner than a human hair. Um, and the problem is because they're so small they can be airborne or suspended in the air for hours or even days. Just some of the definitions. Um, airborne asbestos, is any fibre of asbestos small enough to be made airborne? Um, and for the purpose of monitoring airborne asbestos, we only count the respirable one. Asbestos contained material, is any material or thing as part of its design contains asbestos? Um, asbestos contaminated dust or debris, means any dust or debris that is settled within a workplace and is or is assumed to be contaminated with asbestos. Um, asbestos related work means any work involving asbestos other than removal. 
friable asbestos um, is any material that is in a powder form that can be crumbled or pulverized by hand pressure alone and contains asbestos. Non friable asbestos is the bonded variety, um, has a bonding compound, um, sheeting, and that sort of material. Respirable asbestos is any asbestos fibre that's less than three microns wide, more than five microns long, as a length to width ratio of more than three to one, which is the one we look for when doing airborne monitoring. Um, just where asbestos is found, just got some pictures showing various ones we've come across. Up the top there's some flat cement sheet and moulded cement products, which most people have seen. Uh, on the bottom is some sprayed on fireproofing and insulation. Floor tiles and lino backing. Um, we find in so, uh, ceiling tiles that uh, popcorn vermiculite. Window putties, mastics and joints, you can see up the top. Down the bottom, we've got roof shingles and the corrugated roofing. Fire doors and fire blankets, uh, adhesives. A lot of people think it's always in the blackjack blue, but it's not always blackjack blue, it's any adhesive. Switchboarding and switches. Uh, they used to make the fake snow, protective um, suits. There's some various pictures of where we've come across it, up in the ceilings, behind other material, which always makes it hard when you're consulting your register and it hasn't been destructive and you'll be knocking through something else and find it. Um, safe doors. I guess the point here is it's found in a lot of materials and not all of them are commonly known. Brake linings and clutch pads, gaskets, furnace gloves, joint expands, expanding foam. Oops, sorry, gone too far now. Let's go back. Wall and ceiling texture coatings, meter boards, pipe lagging, uh, lots and lots of different materials. We found it in wallpaper before. Just to, once it comes up. Sorry about the technical difficulties here, everybody. I'm too fast on the mouse. Uh, a handy little guide by the Australian government is a locations diagram on their website about where in your house you can find them. Oh, we should catch up here. How do you identify asbestos? There's really only one way. Um, it, that's through a NADA accredited lab. Sorry, we'll wait for these slides to catch up here. Oops. Sorry, Stephanie, I might need you to go back for me. Sorry, everybody, technical difficulties here. Sorry, Stephanie, will you be able to take the slides back? There we go. Um, so how do I identify asbestos? So submitting a SAM to a NADA accredited testing facility is really the only way to conclusively detect the presence of asbestos. Um, sometimes people will just visually look, but it's not 100% accurate. Just on the right hand side, um, just what the different fibres look like under polarised light microscopy. Um, we've got the Christol up the top, amosite in the middle, and the Christol light down the bottom. Some useful tools. Curtin University has um, produced an app called the ACM Check App, which is worth downloading if you're in the workplace or inside your home. The Victorian government also have another app um, about finding and where to look in various workplaces and houses. 
One of our biggest issues is when you find, especially in home or in your workplace, is it's generally the phone call we receive is we were demolishing, demolishing, demolishing uh, building or home renovating, and people don't often call if they've already broken the material. So our advice is don't, don't commence renovation or demolition work until you've identified any material. For sampling, engage an asbestos assessor, occupational hygienist, or a qualified professional to take a small sample of the material. Submit it to an ARDA accredited laboratory. There's currently three in Tasmania. Then wait for your result. The result should be same day or within 24 hours. If asbestos is observed, engage a professional asbestos removalist. Um, if there's no asbestos observed, you can carry on with your job. Um, this little promotional slide, which you can all read later. Um, just some other resources, Works at Tasmania, Safe Work Australia, and Asbestos Free Tasmania have a lot of material on what to look for. Um, that was just a brief little introduction as to what it is and where it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. So uh, a question has come in. Um, when did the window putty stop with the asbestos? Ah, now that's interesting because window, it's like a lot of material. Um, there was a day when asbestos wasn't meant to be used anymore. And to have a definitive date doesn't often work because sometimes not everyone was on the same page and will find the material still. Um, even in uh, some houses, you'll find four or five sheets which are all normal and there might be one asbestos sheet for some reason. Um, people building their own homes, renovating with excess material, maybe didn't know the law so well. Um, that's generally the older wooden frames, but we have found it in the newer frames as well. All right, thank you. And another question, is there an indication of how much, it's, it's, sorry, is there an indication of how much an asbestos test would be? Um, it varies, it does vary. Um, I don't want to do pricing. Obviously, there's three different labs in Tasmania. Look, it, it's generally a lot cheaper to have it tested than find out afterwards. Um, but, but as far as I'm aware, all the laboratories are well below $100 for each sample. It depends on the material, but I imagine we're all roughly the same and it's less than 100 per sample. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, what year was asbestos introduced and removed from the market? Ah, no, that is a good question. Um, introduced basically has always been here ever since um, they've started building, basically. And then um, you guys are probably better to answer when it was outlawed in Australia. Uh, that's a difficult question for me to ask. And uh, look, I'll explain that a little bit more. Australia did say we weren't allowed to import or use the products anymore. What we have found mm -hmm. is some products imported from other countries, there might be an asbestos mine next door and the fibres still get into the material that way. So. It's rare, but um, I think we all heard about the ones with crayons recently. That's because they were making the crayons next to someone, uh, next to a building that was making asbestos products. So, yeah. mm -hmm. And we'll just take one final question before we move on to the next uh, presentation. So what type of modern day materials have asbestos, for example, products or materials sourced from overseas where asbestos is allowed? Ah, that's an interesting one too, because what we have found is what I was saying before, um, it might not be imported as containing asbestos, but you don't know where it was made and what it was made next door to. And it's my understanding that you're not allowed to import asbestos anymore. So, so right. I have heard Thank recently you, um, some breaks on go-karts that came in, but yeah, it all depends. All right. Thank you, very, thank you, Matt, very much for your presentation, and we'll we'll move on to uh, to the next uh, thank presenter. You. So our next presenter is WorkSafe Tasmania. To, sorry, WorkSafe Tasmania's Michael Rawlings. Mick is senior inspector at WorkSafe Tasmania. He has over thirty years work experience in forestry, mining and construction. Mick's qualifications include a diploma in work health and safety, a certificate four in workplace training and assessment, lead auditor qualification, certificate four in harvesting and haulage, and a certificate four in government investigations. Welcome Mick.
Lights to work here. So under the Work Health and Safety Regulations Tasmania, a person conducting a business or undertaking a resident column at PCBU must not carry out or direct or allow a worker to carry out work involving asbestos. That work involves supplying, transporting, storing, removing, installing, handling, treating, disposing, or disturbing of asbestos or ACM, which is asbestos containing materials, except under some described circumstances. Australia, the banning of asbestos, Australia started phasing out the use of asbestos in 1980, but asbestos was still mined in Australia up until 1984, which brings into some of the questions that was put to Matt. The final prohibition of the asbestos in the workplace come into effect on the 31st of December, 2003. So even though we started banning it in, phasing it out in the 1980s, um, banned it in around the 1990s, there was quite a long lead time because of stuff that was already in store, um, old supplies. There was sometimes there wasn't a replacement product for the asbestos. So there was quite a big lead time before it became totally banned in 31st December, 2003. And so that prohibition also was to the supply of asbestos and also prohibits the sale of asbestos or asbestos containing product materials. So who has the duties to manage and control asbestos or asbestos containing materials? It's the PCBU with the management or control of the workplace must ensure, so as far as reasonably practical, that all asbestos or asbestos containing materials at the workplace is identified by a competent person, or if it can't be identified, you must assume that its presence is there. So the person with the management and control of the workplace may not necessarily be the person that owns the building. So, for instance, if you're leasing or hiring a building off another person to run a business from, it is up to you to make sure there is an asbestos. Asbestos has been identified in that building. So, PCBU must also ensure that an asbestos register has been prepared, maintained, reviewed, and importantly, kept at the workplace. It must be readily available for the workers, their health and safety representatives, and other persons that may enter that building. As a workplace inspector, if I come out to a building, it, it is something that I'll be asking for to look at. Do you have an asbestos register available? You must ensure that when management or control of the workplace is relinquished, a copy of the asbestos register is given to the person assuming the management control. So if you are leasing or hiring a business, a building to run your business out of, if you're moving to another business or for some reason you're moving out of that business, you must ensure that the asbestos register stays with that business and is handed on to whoever's taking back over. That may be the person that owns the building, that may be the new leasee that's coming into that building. The PCBU must also ensure there's a management plan prepared and maintained and reviewed at least every five years. So once you've gone through and identified where all the asbestos is within your building, you've got to come up with a management plan for it. So what are you going to do to protect that asbestos? That also must be at the workplace and must be accessible to workers, again, their health and safety representatives and to other people, so like your tradies. So if you're having somebody come in to do any electrical work or doing a bit of a reno on it, you must have that management plan and a register and you must give that to the trades people that's coming in. We have a bit of a fairly simple sort of a asbestos register here, which incorporates a management plan. Um, and so if you look at line 26, it just gives you the building name. So it's a district hospital. It's on the ground floor. It's the administration's work area. And then it gives you a description of what the asbestos is. So this is speckled off-white vinyl tiles lining the walls. And it's when you're doing the asbestos register, it's also always a really good idea to submit to put in a photo of there. So you're not just describing it, you've got something visual you can look at and match it up and go, yep, that's exactly where it is. So you can see the inspection date is on the 10th of October. It's bonded or a stable condition. Because they're tiles on a wall, they're actually bond bonded. So it's bonded within the tile matter. The exposure to the material is continuous because there's people actually working in that 
building and they've done a risk assessment and the risk assessments come back come in as low because it's in good condition very little damage of issue of it being damaged and they've got a review date between three two and three years leave it in place and here's your management action so and it's taken is put some warning labels up as you can see there a sample was taken for analysis and no asbestos was detected and that could be the reason is in a lot of tiles the percentage of asbestos in some tiles is very low and because you don't want to pull a whole tile off the wall and get the whole lot sampled the sample size may have been very small and when they've done the NARDA testing there may not have been any in that sample doesn't mean there's none in the tiles however so then if we have a look at line 27 same hospital same floor same work area but with this one it's the access ramp adjoining the room and this is also covered with speck of white of tiles again there's a photo sampled and this one's actually come back as friable and unsealed and once again it's continuous exposure and because it's friable um, there's urgent action required so the recommendation is there is to remove and replace that as soon as possible there's warning signs being put on there to let, let everybody do it. So they're two very similar um, materials in very similar spots, but because of the condition of them, actually changes the way that you're going to manage it from your asbestos register and management. Here we have a sign of some of the signs that surround. Um, asbestos warning may contain one. There's one there, the triangular one, asbestos above ceiling. It's important to have that if you've got, say, a old Super 6 style roof, asbestos style roof, and you may be having people get up in the ceiling access, you need to have these sort of signs before they actually enter the roof cavity. It's a waste of time having signs up in a roof cavity when people are already going to get up in there and there could be asbestos dust or in the, in the ceiling cavity. You, as a PCBU or a business owner, also have a duty to limit the use of equipment. So a person conducting business undertaking must not use or direct or allow to work it to use any of the following on asbestos or asbestos containing materials, which is your high pressure water sprays like your carches or your gurneys and compressed air. So if you've got asbestos cladding around the outside of your building, it is up to you to make sure, for instance, somebody graffitied the side of your wall, you don't let one of your workers or yourself get out there and hit it with high pressure water because that can actually break down the fibres on that asbestos sheet, gets into the ground, wind picks them up, and you can be spreading asbestos fibres that way. But that does not apply to high pressure water spray for firefighting and fire protection purposes. Person conducting business and undertaking must also not use or allow a worker to use any of the following equipment. So power tools, so you can't actually allow anyone to drill into asbestos um, equipment. If there's asbestos containing dust around, you're not allowed to sweep it up with brooms or other implements that can release airborne asbestos into the atmosphere. But there are some times that you can use these sort of equipment, but they're specially designed equipment that will actually design to capture and capture any asbestos dust or anything that gets around before it becomes airborne. So you have a duty to ensure asbestos removal is licensed. So if you've come across and you've found asbestos in your workplace and you decide you want to get rid of it, you must make sure that whoever you've contracted to get rid of it is a licensed asbestos removalist, and that's licensed through WorkSafe Tasmania. But sub-regulation one doesn't apply if the asbestos is to be removed is 10 square metres or less of non-friable asbestos or asbestos containing dust associated with the removal of that small amount. But if you're going to remove or have one of your employees remove that less than 10 square metres of asbestos, it doesn't mean they can't be trained. That person must also be trained in the removal and safe handling of asbestos in the workplace. It just means they don't have to be a licensed asbestos removalist and they don't have to notify WorkSafe of the removal, but they, your employee or yourself still has to be trained in the removal of the asbestos, even though it's only for a small, small amount. When it comes to demolition or refurbishment work, prior to the demolition or refurbishment work starting, you must review the asbestos register 
and ensure all the specimens are likely to be disturbed or identified or removed so far as, as reasonably practical. So if you're going to do any refurb or demolition work, if it's practical to do so, you remove the asbestos first before you let any of the other trades come in and start doing their work. And you must provide a copy of your asbestos register to the person carrying out that demolition or refurbishment work before the work commences. If you much in an emergency occur, so um, say you've got an awning out over your business and the awning's lined with asbestos, um, delivery truck comes through, runs into your awning and the asbestos falls down onto your drive through You are allowed to get that cleaned up. Um, it's what we call an, an emergency approval. And so get hold of a licensed asbestos removalist, they can come in, they can clean it up, and then we allow them to notify us as the regulator about the emergency afterwards. Because um, normally they have to advise us five days before the before the removalist takes place. So a little bit of history. Asbestos was widely used in the construction and the installation material in buildings until the late 80s when ban on its manufacture and use was put in place. But as I said earlier, it was only completely prohibited from December 2003. So there's quite a long lead time from when we started to ban it till the time that it was actually completely out of the system. As the bans were not absolute prior to 2003, and building materials may have been stockpiled, stored or recycled and used, it's possible that asbestos may be present in buildings that were constructed up to and possibly later than December 2003. Um, on that slide there, you can see some photos of planter pots. That was made by Goliath at Routon. They had a um, product called Tasbestos and they made planter pots, garden ornaments, water baths, composting bins and stuff like that. So because of the amount of them that was made, they could have been sitting in nurseries until someone decided to buy them well after December 2003, unbeknown that they were asbestos contained products and they may more than likely still out there in gardens and so forth. So the main construction materials used was from timber, brick, steel, and cement sheet. Your cement sheet is present in your house or your workplace, and it was installed up to 1990. It is very likely to contain, contain bonded asbestos in the cement samples. For example, the roof in the photo there is Super 6 roofing, corrugated sheeting, and it's most likely to contain asbestos. Also, areas of buildings that were prone to wet conditions may contain asbestos in the walls and floors due to its hardness. It was very good for waterproofing. And compared to some of the other materials, and also examples in bathroom tiles. I'm pretty sure we've all seen tiles that look like that from our younger days. And likewise, pipes throughout the buildings carry water, sewage may also contain asbestos. And it also shows up in carpet underlays. Um, Asbestos used to be transported in Hessian bags all around the country, and they decided instead of having all these Hessian bags sitting in buildings all over the place, they put them through a flocking machine and turn them into carpet underlays to so all be contaminated with asbestos. So with the removal work, so the person with management control of the workplace, which is you if you're running a business, it has to control the workplace is informed that the asbestos removal work is to be carried out in the workplace. So if you're getting asbestos removal work done out, it is you, your job as PCBU to inform your workers and other people in that building that you're having asbestos work removed, asbestos removed. The person must ensure that the following persons are informed that asbestos work is going to be carried out. And it's the person's workers or any other person at the workplace and the person who commissions the asbestos removal work. Person must also take all reasonable steps to ensure that the following persons are informed that the removal work is going to be carried out of the workplace. That's anyone conducting a business or undertaking at or in the immediate vicinity of the workplace. So if you've got a little shop in a larger shopping complex or something, you're getting some asbestos removed from your shop. You have a duty to inform all the other shops around you that you're having that asbestos removed. And you also have a duty to limit the access of the person to be person to into the removal area. 
So a person with a management control at the workplace who is aware of licensed specialist removal work is being carried out in that workplace. And you must ensure so far as reasonably practical that no other other than the following has access to the removal. There the work is engaged in the asbestos removal work and other persons associated with the asbestos removal work and anyone allowed under these regulations or another law to be in that asbestos removal work. So under our regulation, there are some people that are allowed to enter into an asbestos removal area. But that person who's in control of the asbestos removal area may refuse access to anyone to enter that area into a controlled measure to implement excuse me, workplace in relation to the asbestos or at the direction of the licensed asbestos removalist. And that's all I've got for you this afternoon. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Mick. So a couple of uh, questions uh, for you. So when do you no longer need an asbestos register for a workplace? For example, new buildings uh, built in the last few years that do not have asbestos in them. Do you need to prove there is no asbestos? No, pretty well we look at buildings that were built prior to 1990. So any building uh, built after 1990 isn't required to have an asbestos register, but prior to 1990, we expect to have an asbestos. And even prior to 1990, if you've had an, you've got an asbestos in your building, um, you've got an asbestos register, you've had a removalist come in and remove that asbestos, it still remains in the register where asbestos and such and such was found and removed in such and such a date, but it stays within the register. All right, thank you. What would be the size of a sample to get a good reading? Um, that depends. A lot of the products had different percentages of asbestos. Um, like a lot of the tiles could only have five to ten percent of asbestos within the tile. Um, then other stuff, it may be um, some of the backing on um, that fake brick boards and stuff can be up around the 80, 90 percent asbestos. So for that sort of stuff, you only need a very small sample. If it's lower percentage of asbestos within the product, you need a larger sample. Um, but if you think it's asbestos, you're really better off to assume that it is and get a sample. And if you can get obviously the larger sample size, the better the better chance you've got to detect it if it is there. All right, thank you. You talked about asbestos and, and drilling. Can you talk a little bit more about that and if if it can be done or if it can't be done and, and what precautions um, should be taken? Uh, drilling, excuse me, drilling through asbestos sheet. It can be done under circum, certain circumstances. Um, it's not advised, but it, it can be done. And what you have to do is make sure you've got measures in place to control the spread of any dust. So when you do go to drill into an asbestos sheet, you're not creating dust um, flying around everywhere. Um, some people, you can use what's called um, shadow vacuuming, but when you're vacuuming with asbestos dust, you got, can't just use the hoover that you've got down at Godfrey's. It's got to be a special um, hazardous vacuum cleaner with a proper HEP, HEPA filter. So even you get home variety vacuum cleaners have got a HEPA filter, they're not good enough for asbestos. It's got to be a proper hazardous vacuum cleaner if you're going to be doing um, shadow vacuuming while you're drilling and so forth. Or otherwise, um, I've heard people try to use shaving cream all around and drill through that. So anything that comes through the shaving cream, cream will capture the dust of the asbestos. Not my ideal way of doing things, but it's been, I've been told that's one way people get around it. All right, thanks Mick. Um, if I'm having a trade visit my home, for example a plumber, an electrician, what can or should I expect them to do to protect themselves and me from asbestos? Um, if it's a residential home you're not required to have an asbestos register. Um, if you're having a plumber or a tradie come there and you assume that there may be asbestos within your home, you just inform them, let them know there may be asbestos there. Um, and depending on where it is, if it's a asbestos cement sheet, I'd advise them not to go smashing holes or anything in it. 
But if they're getting up into your roof space and you've got an asbestos um, roof on there and they're getting up into your roof space, there's a really good chance that over time some asbestos spiders has dropped off the roof sitting on top of your ceiling. So you can take precautions like getting whoever's trade is that's getting up in there to wear basically um, full RPE, which is respirator, um, have a suit, Tyvek suit for him and get that, get done up as if he was going to be doing asbestos removal just to get up into that thing. But then also set up for when you're coming back down, set up a bit of a personal decontamination area for him. So lay out some plastic from underneath your manhole so any dust or anything that's dropping out of the ceiling comes down, drops down under there. He gets changed off with all of his RPE. Then that all gets wrapped up, sealed up, double wrapped and treated as asbestos product. And so most council tips for household asbestos, they have been there, you can take it too. So you double wrap it in, um, it's 0.2 millimeter meter or 2000 UPM plastic. So it's a fairly thick plastic, like a builder's plastic, or you quite often see that orange plastic wrap. Double wrap it in that. But so if I had somebody getting in my ceiling space, because I've got quite an old house, but there's no asbestos in there. But if I thought there was, I do the same because I've got that Charlie Fluff insulation. So when I'm coming back out of the ceiling anyway, I have something down there to catch all that. So you set it, get them to set up a little decon. Um, if you're worried about it, stay out of the air, but make sure they clean off and everything in that little decon area, pile it all up. That way you're not getting asbestos, potentially asbestos dust into your carpets and everything and trapping through your house. All right, thanks Mick. You, you talked about the asbestos register pre-2006. Can you just um, confirm what you spoke about in that space? 2006. Uh, 2000. Nope, lost. <laughs> asbestos register pre-2006. No, don't know. Um, but asbestos reg business has to have asbestos register set up. Buildings built prior to 1990. I'm not sure where the 2006 comes from. All right, thanks for that clarification. Um, we'll just take one final question before we move on to the next presenter, Mick. Uh, so you, you talked about obviously. Um, domestic and uh, requirements of an asbestos register. Are there any um, removal laws around removal um, that apply to domestic owners? Um, there is, but it's not, um, doesn't come under our jurisdiction for residential properties, but that comes under the EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency. They have similar laws to what we have, but deals with um, domestic or private re residences. So. It's the same thing really, anything over 10 square metres, it has to be done by a licensed asbestos removalist. And that 10 square metres isn't if you've got a shed that's 40 square metres, the 10 square metres isn't take 10 square metre wall off this weekend and then a 10 square metre wall off next weekend, it's the whole job. So if you've got 10 square metres in total, you're allowed to remove it yourself. Obviously with training and all the right gear and all that sort of stuff. Over that, you, even for a domestic premises, you need to engage a licensed asbestos removalist, and there is a list of them on the WorkSafe web, WorkSafe website. Thank you very much, Mick. So we'll move on to our next presentation and presenter. And our next presenter is Cancer Council Tasmania's Duncan Giblin. Duncan is Cancer Prevention Team Leader at Cancer Council Tasmania. Duncan has a strong focus on increasing awareness of occupational health risk and increasing people's confidence in adopting behavioural change. He is a sitting member Sorry, he's a sitting member on the National Cancer Council Australia Occupational and Environmental Cancers Committee. Duncan has previously worked in the civil construction, fishing and building industries, and he says this background is his motivation to help workplaces and workers make better health choices. Welcome, Duncan. Good day. Um, so firstly, yeah, um, I would just like to say, uh, Thanks for WorkSafe Taz for having me along. Um, today we're going to talk about 
uh, we're going to talk about the uh, ways in which you can reduce um, or implement. Uh, sorry, my slides weren't coming up then. Um, yeah, we can talk about the ways in which you can support uh, change in your workplace and also provide some information on how um, the Cancer Council can support those who may be affected by cancer. Um, so, oops, um, and we'll talk about that context uh, in behavioural change with both an, as an individual or an organisation. Um, so what's the impact? Um, so the Australian mesothelioma register uh, recently um, identified that the estimated health system expenditure uh, was around 27.4 million in the 2018-2019 financial year in Australia. Uh, the number of cases diagnosed each year for both men and women has steadily increased over the past 40 years. The extended latency from exposure to asbestos um, to a diagnosis of mesothelioma means that uh, people are often but not always affected during retirement. And that's a bit of a key point because when a lot of people are working when they're younger, they see it as something that might happen later on. What we want people to know is that sometimes those diagnoses happen earlier and also as we look into it a little bit more further is that even those outcomes when we're older have a really huge impact. Um, Australia has one of the highest measured incidents of mesothelioma rates in the world. Um, so we uh, really, yeah, we really do have a high level of um, burden of disease here in Australia. Um, so given that there's a reasonable amount of awareness around what some of the problems are um, and, and to some degree some of the level of risk, most people would have heard of mesothelioma or asbestosis. Um, one of the things we want to talk about is, is why do people um, not use the right protective strategies? Um, and in re some recent uh, studies into preventing respiratory disease and also the feedback we get when we're talking to people uh, in construction and building is that um, there's a whole range of factors and if you don't really understand those factors either as part of your organisation or part of your workforce it's going to be much harder to, to come up with some solutions. Um, so a big one we always get when we talk to people, and again, it bore out in the research, was that um, time pressure um, and cost. So people feeling under a significant amount of pressure to get a job done, and that can be either a perception from a from a from a worker um, or a management expectation um, that people, I uh, guess, get tasked under certain certain time frames. Um, and, and within that there's some solutions that we'll talk about later but there needs to be a communication based solution to those. Um, incorrect beliefs around risk and that's a really common one. Um, so sometimes we get comfortable in certain beliefs. So for example if you've been doing something for a certain, certain way for a longer period of time and then when you find out more about the risk it's easier to hold on to that belief because you're worried about what the actual outcome might be if the new information is true. So uh, challenging that within your workforce is a really key part in uh, supporting behavioural change. Uh, workplace culture, which kind of fits with that a little bit. Um, so complacency can happen. We can be really good when we learn about a new thing. Um, or a new risk and then over time those other things like time pressure um, or some modelling from older workers you know that, that may not be following some of the best practice procedures may creep in. Um, and also sometimes in some industries, uh, some of the industries I used to work in, I used to do demolition and construction um, and do shutdowns out at some of the larger factories and, and one of the things that it's almost like safety was seen somehow as a weakness um, or that taking risk is an admirable trait. Um, and those kind of um, narratives need to be swapped out with looking after you know, your workmates as, 
as being, you know, and providing a safe environment for yourself and for for your workmates is an admirable trait. Um, and older workers, they have a real responsibility, I think, to, to do uh, like effective modelling. What we do know is a lot of people, particularly younger people, learn as much through observation through any other form of learning. So we might even be telling someone to do the right thing, um, but if we're still doing an old old practice that may not be as helpful, that may be the, the behaviour that's picked up. Um, and this is a really big one, so habit. So if if when you learn about a new strategy or a new um, control measure that's going to help improve your, uh, your, your risk profile, one of the key things that will be a hindrance is if there's a lot of repetition in the, in the previous behaviour within the workforce. So that needs to be examined as both an individual and a workforce and, and providing a safe space for people to, to actually change that habit and the support and, and work on the idea of just as much as the habits being formed through a rep repetition of behaviour, being really on top of if you feel that habit's part of what's going on, is being really on top of um, of repetition of the new message. So just telling people things once and letting them know about the consequences is only a very small part of it. It is about repeating those messages. Uh, for example, if I asked everyone to unlearn how to drive by tomorrow, they would think that I was fairly crazy. And if you go back to the first time you learned how to drive, you know, you probably the poor person who owned the car next you know, sitting next to you feared for the clutch because you had to think about everything you did and it didn't come naturally and now you don't even think about changing gear. And it's about getting your workforce to change gear and understanding the impact of habit in that in that space. Um, and inaccurate knowledge around best practice procedures and regulations. And we just really encourage people to seek that information to work with WorkSafe TAS to find out um, the best way to do that and to make sure that every member in, in you know like in your team is a is a, is across what they need to be doing because um, I guess I've got a question in relation to that it, um, and that is out of those things that I just put up there which of those will be a defense in a in a, in a workplace claim or which of those if you ended up getting diagnosed with something would you feel like well it was worth it and the answer to that is none of them so so those contributing factors um, you know like they might be why we've done certain things but they're actually not a mitigation um, so Another thing that we talk to people about with all our different messaging is actually working out a bit of a plan if you want to change a habit or change a workplace behaviour. And there's some simple principles that we use in relation to that. Um, and these are to really identify what it is that you want to do. Um, and that might sound really basic, but if you don't start from that point and, and you don't get to see where everyone else is thinking about what it is they want to change, um, and then a really key thing is getting the right benefits about why this change is important. Um, and again, there might be different motivations for different people, but if you can help the people that you want to make those change, identify the benefits from them, which may actually be different from your workplace goals. And I'll go into that a bit, a bit more, but the more benefits they identify, the more buy-in they'll have with the behavioural change. And then just being really honest about what are the barriers, you know, what can be done differently um, and having a plan. So moving into a strategy, what can you do to address these barriers? And then having another plan for, you know, who can you get support from if you get stuck? So I'll go through, uh, I've got a, um, an example of an individual example, um, which is, um, you know, not getting sick from workplace exposure um, and you know the benefit from that is obviously not getting sick but there's also you know other secondary benefits about being able to provide for your family um, you know looking after your workmates health as well so that sense of team um, you know might be not getting in trouble at work those kind of things um, and you know 
and again, a real common one is people just feel like they don't necessarily always follow through with the best protective control measures because of time pressure. So if that's named up, you know, you put some things in place like um, talking to your supervisor about task time frames and take, you know, taking responsibility for uh, taking the time to follow the correct procedure. Um, and who can they talk to? Every organisation is really different. Some people are sole employees, some people have hundreds and thousands of people working for them but it depends on your structure um, but you know if you have a project safety manager or project manager or safety supervisor and if you if you if you're stuck and you feel like you're not getting anywhere as a worker you have the right to be safe and you can get more support support from work safe tabs and you can find out um, you know more about I guess if you feel like you know you're raising concerns and you and you and you and your practice concerns are not being uh, recognised, you can seek support from WorkSafe Tats. Um, and your workmates again, that whole thing of working as a team is really critical. Um, so for me, when I started working at Cancer Council, I also do some other work. I do some trail construction work, and I, I've got to be really honest, I was really bad at my sun protection. So now outside of putting an app in my phone and all that kind of stuff, I actually get the people that I work, that I supervise on that team, they can tell me off if I'm not doing what I need to be doing and using that kind of um, peer support. Um, I think, you know, that can be a really quite effective thing to do. And also leaders ask people who are working under them to provide them with that guidance, they're more likely to apply that behaviour themselves. Um, and then the next goal is just like a basic organisational kind of, you know, like just looking at a few scenarios there. So if your goal was to protect staff and contractors from work expo uh, workplace exposure, you know, benefits are really obvious, you know, reduced exposure to litigation and increased care for your workforce. I know, you know, most of the people I have dealings with, I know they actually really care about the people that, um, you know, are, uh, you know, doing the work that helps build their business and you, you're protecting an asset and I think most people like to do the right thing. So the benefits are really often quite strong. Um, you know, and a barrier to changing is work is not following procedures. So it's going through, you know, using the strategy is identifying what things might be um, a little problematic or going through those list of potential motivations, seeing what they are and then developing some regular education sessions targeted directly at, at what's, you know, what's behind those behaviours um, and provide a safe environment for airing concerns. It's actually a really strong risk management tool because if someone feels like their, their job's going to be under pressure or they're a contractor and they won't be back if they bring up a safety concern, you're not providing an environment where you're protecting that worker or you're protecting your organisation. Um, and, you know, again, if you need advice around all those control measures, which, you know, there's a lot of complexity to them is seeking that advice from WorkSafe TAS, um, getting them to come in to talk to your workforce, um, talking to Cancer Council TAS um, about coming in and having a chat to your workforce around, you know, some of the health, uh, you know, outcomes from not following procedure and helping them work out, you know, motivational strategies for following that, you know, those correct procedures. Um, and talking to training authorities, you know, that specifically work in those fields. And, I, and I'll also add, you know, like um, people like Matt who provide specialist information. Uh, so, and, um, so when we talk about why is all this important, and remember I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the session we talked about, you know, a lot of younger people see the idea that, well, it might, it's probably only going to happen when I'm older if I get it, you know, if I get a problem when I'm older. Um, firstly, that's not actually true, even though there might be a higher prevalence with mesothelioma because of the latency, but the other thing is, is um, I guess I'd like to introduce everyone to Dennis who came to Cancer Council to share his story. Dennis uh, was doing a lot of foundry work when he was younger and has contracted mesothelioma. Um, he contracted mesothelioma 
uh, not long after retiring and he worked his whole life and he's, you know, he was looking forward to a whole range of things as part of his retirement. Um, and Dennis's statement is, you know, now I've retired, a lot of things I plan to enjoy in my retirement I've had taken away from me through my workplace related lung cancer. Um, and the mental health impacts of that, uh, I guess, uh, you know, and it hasn't just affected Dennis, it's affected his family. Um, and then he's, what he really wants me to tell people is you have the knowledge that he didn't have and you can do something with that. So um, using the recommend, recommended protection uh, and speaking up if something is unsafe is vital. So providing a safe environment where your workers can speak up and if you are a worker, airing your concerns um, is really critical because the impact is really significant. Um, so the next thing that I just wanted to talk about briefly is just if you are affected by um, cancer, um, the Cancer Council Tasmania uh, offer a broad range of support. So we offer things like uh, complementary therapies for people that are dealing with the emotional impact of cancer. We offer some really practical stuff like for people getting treatment who need wigs. Um, there's one-to-one -one support. We have uh, really awesome support groups where people support each other. Uh, you know, we have uh, transport to treatment, which the year, I think it was last year actually, um, those are the cars that you see driving around taking people to appointments where they can't get there because of the impact of their illness, um, means that they can't drive or their partners have to work or they're by themselves. And last year we did enough kilometres to go around the world six and a half times, just in Tassie. Um, so there's a whole range of supports that are available, including um, just being able to have a chat to people and, and helping, you know, when you come out with a diagnosis and you wonder what the future is like having a chat to people and, and getting some information about, um, you know, like even helping you understand where to go next and how to deal with some of the practical stuff. So I, I, I'm very fortunate to work with the team. I'm, uh, in our support group and um, they do amazing, amazing work. So, um, yeah, so if you do know anyone that's impacted by cancer, you know, please touch base if you feel like that support will be useful. Um, and so I guess my take home thoughts is that education and awareness, although important, is only one part of the process. Lasting change takes repetition of messages and review of process. Um, so if you think about it in an advertising context, you know, when you first saw, you know, like a Coke ad, that's not why you remember them 20 years later or 30 years later, it's because they continually advertise um, and they're the first soft drink that just popped into my mind then to use that example. So that, you know, like if you don't repeat message um, and you just have a little bit of a blitz on a particular thing without repeating messages, the message gets lost. Um, Identifying motivations that are relevant to your business and to your team uh, members, it's 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 much um, you know without doing that, it's much harder to uh, achieve lasting change. And workplace safety is a shared responsibility at all levels of risk control and workplace hierarchy. But that's not a. I think sometimes when we've talked to different. Uh, organisations sometimes that's seen as almost like a blaming framework rather than a, um, creating an environment where everyone can really take uh, responsibility for their roles in that and I would have to say also though a lot of organisations really do do that really well too um, so that's a critical thing. Um, uh, if you or your workers or all the workers on your care you know work their whole life you know and became seriously unwell uh, when they should be enjoying their retirement, you know, what would that feel like? You know, what are the impacts financially? Looking at the, I guess, the real term, I guess, outcomes from, from, you know, not following through with something because of under a bit of time pressure. And people do mention, you know, the financial costs and it is harder, you know, in smaller businesses, but the impacts of dealing with a, you know, a litigation process is, is significantly harder, both emotionally and financially. Um, and Cancer Council uh, can help 
if you or someone you know is affected by cancer, not only can we help, it's, it's what our team actually really loves to do. And we're available for people who need that support. So I just want to say again, thanks to WorkSafe Taz and to the other two presenters that went before me, I actually learnt a heap then, which was great. So, and the questions were good too for those guys. Um, yeah, that, there were a lot of things that I was thinking as well. So it's really good um, and really appreciate, um, yeah, being asked to come along and have a chat. Sorry, thank you very much, Duncan, for your for your presentations. Um, no questions have come through at this stage, so we'll move on to our next uh, presentation. So the next uh, presentation um, from WorkSafe Tasmania's uh, Mel Hansen. Unfortunately, Mel could not be with us here today, so her presentation will be provided by a pre-recorded video. Mel manages Tasmania's statutory asbestos compensation scheme, providing support to those harmed by workplace asbestos exposure. Mel brings experience from her work in a variety of claims and case management roles across government and has also worked in areas of policy analysis and investigation. While Mel cannot be with us here today, if anyone does have any questions about the asbestos compensation scheme, please do use the questions window in your control panel to type and submit those questions. Those questions will be followed up as soon as practicable after today's webinar. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today. My name is Mel Hansen. I'm the Claims Coordinator for the Asbestos Compensation Unit at WorkSafe Tasmania. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about Tasmania's Asbestos Compensation Scheme, who it's for, uh, and the application process. So in Tasmania, we have a scheme that provides eligible workers and family members of deceased workers access to statutory compensation. The scheme assists workers and their families who are living with asbestos related diseases by providing access to fair and appropriate compensation without having to go through the common law system. The scheme administers compensation benefits, including lump sum compensation, medical and other expenses, weekly payments and funeral costs. The scheme is legislated under the Asbestos Related Diseases Occupational Exposure Compensation Act 2011 and has now been in operation for 10 years. The legislation requires a review of the operation of the Act to occur every five years, the second of which will be tabled in Parliament by October next year. The administration of the scheme is overseen by the Asbestos Compensation Commissioner, who exercises the decision-making powers provided by the legislation and determines all claims for compensation. The Commissioner is also supported by staff from the Department of Justice, including WorkSafe Tasmania, who administer the legislation. In terms of funding, the scheme is industry funded and receives levy contributions as a percentage of the workers' compensation premiums of self-insurers, licensed insurers and state service agencies. The current levy rate for the current financial year is 2.5% of premium, which is down from 3% last year. Since commencement in 2011, the scheme has received 193 claims from workers and family members and has both raised and paid out approximately $45 million in claims related payments. The scheme is designed to be non-adversarial and to provide no fault and timely compensation to workers suffering from asbestos related disease and to their families. Scheme staff work closely with applicants to ensure that applications are processed accurately and promptly. And there's also an independent medical framework uh, attached to the scheme, and this ensures that medical determinations are made accurately and are evidence-based. The legislation also accommodates some of the difficulties that can be associated with evidencing occupational history, given that the time lag uh, to disease from exposure can be somewhere in the range of some 30 to 60 years. 
The legislation also provides an effective mechanism for resolving disputes if they occur, and this is through the Tasmanian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. To make an application, both workers and certain family members of deceased workers can lodge a claim with the Commissioner. Applications must be in the, uh, excuse me, in the approved form and accompanied by the necessary medical and other evidence required to determine the claim. For worker claims to be eligible for compensation, the person must be or have been a worker in connection with the state as defined by the legislation at the time of exposure to asbestos. A worker must be correctly diagnosed by a medical specialist as having the asbestos related disease and they must also have not received compensation for the same disease, including through a common law settlement. It's important to note that a person who has retired from the workforce may also still be eligible for compensation. For family members of a worker who has died and who had an asbestos related disease, there may be an entitlement to compensation if they are a spouse of the person or a child of the person under age 22. The deceased person would have also been uh, need to have been eligible for compensation if they were still alive and family member claims must be made jointly by all eligible parties. In relation to the medical framework, once the Commissioner is satisfied that uh, the necessary information is available to proceed with the claim, it will be referred through the medical framework. A person with a non-imminently fatal disease and more than two years life expectancy will be referred to an impairment assessor. Uh, this assessment will determine their level of whole person impairment and claims determined to have 10% or more whole person impairment as well as all other claims will then be referred to a medical panel. Medical panels comprise three medical experts who are selected from a medical practitioner register and the Act requires the Commissioner to maintain a register of suitably qualified medical specialists that can be selected to form each panel. All medical questions under the Act are referred or must be referred to a medical panel to determine and once a panel decides a medical question, the Commissioner is then bound by that decision. Medical panels therefore provide uh, a crucial role and the success of the scheme is very much dependent on the availability and expertise of a fairly small group of medical specialists. Once all necessary matters, including medical questions, uh, have been satisfied with an application, the Commissioner can make a final determination in relation to an entitlement to compensation. There are statutory timeframes for assessing and determining claims, uh, with most claims decided within 28 business days. Benefits and payments under the scheme, they differentiate between imminently fatal and non-imminently fatal claims. An imminently fatal asbestos related claim applies to a person who has been formally diagnosed with less than two years life expectancy due to the disease. Imminently fatal conditions might be entitled to a package of lump sum payments, age based lump sum payments, medical expenses, travel expenses uh, and funeral costs. Compensation benefits for non-imminently fatal diagnosed claimants are payable at stepped levels, starting at 10% whole person impairment, up to a maximum lump sum amount, which is payable from 51% impairment onwards. Medical, travel and funeral, co funeral costs may also be claimable for non-imminently fatal claims. Members of the family are entitled to the same amount of lump sum compensation that a worker would have been eligible for if they were still alive. Unfortunately, medical expenses are not payable on these claims. Payments under the scheme are based on statutory prescribed amounts, which are calculated against the basic salary each year. And there are some time limits to apply for compensation in Tasmania. For imminently fatal claims, there is 12 months to apply after being given a medical certificate for the asbestos related disease. For family members, there is 12 months to apply after the death of the worker with the disease. And for non imminently fatal worker claims, there are no time limits to apply. Now, should a person not have made a claim within the statutory time limits, they may lodge an application for an extension of time with the Commissioner. And for further information about our scheme or the application process, 
please visit the WorkSafe Tasmania website, www.worksafe.tas.gov.au and look under the Asbestos Compensation section for forms and guidance material. Uh, you can call us at WorkSafe on 1300 366 322 or you can send us an email directly at acc at justice.tas.gov.au. Thanks very much. So thank you, Mel, and apologies to um, everyone. We understand that there may have been a few um, uh, tech or audio issues um, regarding that video. So we uh, will look to provide you with that presentation um, again in due course. So that brings us to the end of um, all of our presentations. Oops, I should go back one. Um, so now we'll take uh, any questions or we'll follow up on any questions that uh, that have come through for all of our presenters. Let's just wait for their webcams to come up. There we go. All right, welcome back everyone. <laughs> And thank you. So, so we'll just go through the questions and um, uh, please uh, respond uh, accordingly. Um, so, how do you become a trained, uh, or, or how how do you become a trained, or, or can you or do, can you talk about um, asbestos and, and and training and that that is required? So how do you so become a trained asbestos removalist is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> is that one for you, Mick, or do you want me to ask that one? Is that no, for a removalist yeah. or an assessor? Uh, the uh, question indicates removalist, but if you want to talk about both. Yeah, it's like anything really. It's it's training and experience to make you competent. Um, we, we run um, asbestos removalist course, both friable and non friable but then there's regulations next to that as well, saying you must have the experience to be able to manage the job um, in supervision. To become an assessor, once again, there, there's a course you can do, but there's also experience. Um, so uh, it's licensed under the regulator, whether you can be an assessor or whether you can be a removalist, but, but it really is, it's that training, but then followed up with the experience. And ultimately it's determined by the um, regulator who says, yes, you may or may not have a license, depending on your experience and qualifications. And so just following on from that, um, so, so once you've gone through and done your training, it means you can be employed by a licensed asbestos removalist as a worker for, for them. It doesn't mean you can just go straight out and start removing, get an ABN and go out and start removing asbestos on your own, because you need to be able to have a asbestos supervisor to work under and also an asbestos removalist license, which is issued through WorkSafe TAS. So, yeah, if, if you want to go out in your own business to become a asbestos removalist, there is a few steps and it takes a few years to get that experience all the way through. All right, thank you. As an electrician, do I need to have completed an asbestos removal course? And this probably comes to the same one, removal course to remove an asbestos meter panel. Um, because it is under the 10 square metres, you don't, it's really handy to have asbestos um, uh, awareness, training and so forth. But the thing with the asbestos metres, they're under the 10 square metres. Um, and even though if you have to remove them, you, you still have to know how, how to treat it as an asbestos product. So. Even though you don't have to be a licensed asbestos removalist, it'd be very worthwhile to go to a asbestos removal course for non friable just to learn some of the tricks and tips on how to go about removing asbestos where causing dust, damage, so forth, and how to better prepare, how to wrap it, and how to dispose it. All right, thanks. Do you know the average time for the, I'm going to um, meso to show up? 
if that makes sense. Mesothelioma. Um, it's yes. It's... <laughs> I think it the I think it's normally between thirty and sixty years, um, and it's just the way the disease has because the small the small little fibres get into your lungs. Once they get into your lungs and penetrate your lungs, they, they don't come out. And so over the years, they just keep irritating the lung. There's more scar tissue grow on there. And yeah, it can take a long time for mesophilioma to show up. And like I said, they, they reckon sometimes between 30 to 60 years. All right, thanks. If a home has an asbestos roof, is there a risk that the roof cavity will have asbestos dust from the roof? Um, yes, there is. Depends on the condition of the roof itself. But if my advice would be, if you had an asbestos roof, I would treat anywhere in that ceiling space as potentially contaminated with asbestos containing materials. Absolutely. And some of the monitoring we've done, um, have conducted so certainly confirms that as well. All right, thank you. What are the relative risk profiles of asbestos dust, MDF, and dust from plasterboard or timber cutting? I'll throw that one to you, Matt. Um, I guess it's an educated guess. I mean, uh, the asbestos are the little fibres which are just sort of pierce the lungs. Um, the risk there is obviously higher. Any any dust is not ideal. And, um, but for me, I, I don't just do asbestos. If I go into a roof space, I wear a mask for any of the dust up there. Um, not just that, bird droppings, animal droppings. It look, and look, in a workplace, you shouldn't be exposed to anything. So um, I would always wear a mask if there's dust. It doesn't have to be asbestos. There's different diseases and they're all individual. Um, I think it's safe to always wear a dust mask, no matter what the dust. The risk profile, though, is it'd be unique to the person and the exposure. And it's it's generally not a one-off exposure, it's repeat exposure over time. So, so it's, it's, it, that would be individual, much, much like asbestosis. Um, so for me, any dust, you should wear the appropriate respiratory equipment would be my answer. We um, sometimes we we get asked about different substrates when we're doing presentations. Uh, we have a really simple flow chart, which is: is it oxygen that you're breathing in? If it's no, then use protection. You know, if it's, it's that simple. If it's, yeah, anything else that um, can cause inflammation on the lungs can contribute to you know your risk of developing cancer. Absolutely. Thank you. Is asbestos still used in Australia? No, um, but sometimes it can still get into Australia. Um, as was mentioned earlier, every now and then there's recalls on some products because it, because Australia's banned it, not allowed to import it, not allowed to sell it, not allowed to supply it, but there are still circumstances of it coming in. Um, here a couple of years ago, there was some motorbikes that had recalls because there was asbestos and brakes. And surprisingly, and I found it very surprising because I owned one of these motorbikes, it wasn't the cheap ones from China or Taiwan. That was big brand name motorbikes come in and they had asbestos in the brake pad. So they all got recalled, had to have it taken out. So it does still get, it does still get into Australia, but very little. Um, and like, it's just when you're importing stuff, do you really know where every component of that thing that you've imported comes from? All right, thank you. Um, a, a question, where do you get the plastic bags uh, that are already marked asbestos? Bunnings or any hardware store generally. All right, thank you. That's, that's an easy one. Okay. <laughs> Um, can you also uh, tell us if asbestos containing insulation was ever used in Tasmania? Are we talking about the roof ins insulation? Um, as in, the, um, I'm wondering if they're talking about the pumping insulation. Um, and I don't think the pumping insulation was asbestos contained in Tasmania, but there was 
um, spray on insulation used and spray on fireproofing. And that was used quite quite regularly throughout Tasmania. But for the domestic, not 100% sure, but I think for the domestic um, pump in insulation, like your Charlie fluff type stuff and everything, I don't think there was asbestos products brought into Tasmania for that purpose. All right, thank you. So there's still time to um, ask our presenters uh, any questions that uh, that you might have. Please use the questions window on your control panel to type and submit any of those questions. So a question, what controls are there after the asbestos has been disposed of in rubbish tips? What happens after 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? What are the risks of puncture and Le leakaging, I think I'm going to say that word. Um, yeah, well, all asbestos has to be disposed of in um, there a designated hazardous waste disposal tip. And so there's a couple of them around Tasmania. So even if you take it to your local tip, they just don't put it into their normal landfill. It goes to a designated um, tip, tip face. Uh, tip spots where that that is only used for hazardous materials it's recorded as having hazardous waste put in it so it's not only asbestos that goes into these places but lots of other nasties um, so the likelihood of ever being turned into a dog park or housing commission housing homes and so forth get away um, also with the um, asbestos leacher one thing about asbestos is it's one of the issues that doesn't go away it won't leach into the ground um, it's just going to be sealed there and unless it actually gets transported by humans, um, that's where it's going to stay in for a very long time. All right, thank you. Can you talk a bit more about asbestos uh, roofs um, in sheds and, and fibres? Uh, do you want to have a chat with that one, Matt? Uh, so the sheds and fibres coming from the roof. Um, it depends on the material the roofs were made with and whether how, how much it's been destructed by the weather over the time, um, really. And we've seen a lot of where the asbestos roofing, but there's also a ceiling that was asbestos. Maybe people have removed the ceiling, left some dust up there from the boards. Um, it really does depend on the condition and the condition's everything. If it's been cracked and busted over time, obviously that material's gonna fall down into the roof space and, and so certainly add to the dust content. But, but and how it's been cared for, was it painted, has it been, been kept um, maintained? There's no single answer. Um, a lot of that corrugated roofing that's uh, generated over time, maybe been cracked a lot, broken open, obviously there's going to be more exposure potentially than one that's been maintained. Does that make sense? Thank you. A question uh, for you, Mick. Is there a safe way to drill asbestos given you seemed reluctant on shaving cream other than um, shadow vacuuming? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> not, not really, not that I know of. Um, it really requires a way to control the dust. So when you are drilling, you're not crating and spreading the dust around there. So yep, I know people do use shaving cream. It must work because people still use it. Um, and yeah, you're not going to go out and buy a hazardous vacuum cleaner just to drill a couple of holes through something. So, yeah, but that, that's the main thing is just to be able to control that dust so it's not escaping and you can actually clean it up and keep all the dust in one spot and dispose of it as asbestos contaminated materials. All right, thank you. For local government, who gets a complaint that a private property owner is doing building works and failing to follow the correct removal procedure? Whose responsibility is it to enforce public safety? Um, if it's a private residence, WorkSafe doesn't have any jurisdiction on a private residence unless it's the work's been taken out by a, say, say like a contract. So if a private residence gets in a building or something like that, then yeah, we can take some action. Um, also councils can have a role to play if it's a private residence under their um, local, local acts. And also the Environmental Protection Agency 
they have powers where they can enforce as well for private residences. All right, thank you. Asbestos is a mined fibre. Is there any exposure risk from excavation? I'm happy to answer that, my mate. Um, yep. Excavating like normal rock geology, like trenching and that sort of thing, I assume the question refers to. Um, I would assume that samples are taken before they start digging the rock. The, the, it's, it's not, I'm not an expert in this, but from my understanding, the geology of Tasmania is pretty well mapped out and where the, it is located. Um, it comes down to that awareness. If they were digging and they saw something that looked like it could be a naturally occurring fibre, then that's when you'd stop. Um, the, there are still mines in Australia that don't mine asbestos. There's small bodies in the ore that they're mining and that they've got controls around that about how they blast, how they keep it wet. Um, I, I would have to consult with the geologist. I would have thought the risk is pretty low just from trenching the depth. But, but it comes down to that awareness of knowing what you're doing and what to look out for. Um, I haven't heard of it in trenching, but it doesn't mean so it wouldn't happen, but it's, it's actually something I'll follow up on because that question hasn't been asked. It's a good question. Um, if, if there's potentially naturally occurring fibre that's that low, then yeah, it is potential. But um, that's something I'd like to get back to, and if that's okay, I'll check with the geologist and find out how common it is or could it happen. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay. Oh, and just with that, like the the risk from just um, trenching, like digging out, would be quite low. You get up, up into a higher risk though if you start when you start processing that material. So if you're running it through a crushing plant or stuff like or something like that, you're going to increase the risk because there there is a, um, some asbestos naturally formed asbestos rock and everything in there. When you start processing, run through a crusher, you're going to have more chance of actually turning that product into friable product and releasing it the fibres into the air. All right, thank you. Can you talk a bit more about the risk from breathing plasterboard sandings? As in the risk of plaster and the dust from pl um, plaster? Yes. Uh, probably not. The risk is going to depend how much dust is created because I'm assuming we're not talking asbestos anymore, we're now talking about plaster dust. I think even Duncan might know more about that than me, do you, Duncan? Um, I look again. Comes down to the flow chart of is it oxygen? If it's not, yeah. don't, don't breathe it in. I'd use any kind of filtration when you're doing any kind of construction dust. But, um, yeah, like um, it's, it's plaster dust is not something that's sort of come up as a, a scheduled risk in any of the occupational cancer thing. But I, I. I, you know, again, we're also talking about a fairly broad range of substrates. You know, there's a lot of older plasters that may have a whole range of things in them. So I'd just be, you know, like going back to, you know, turn of the century based cons construction methods. So it's a really broad range of things. Um, you know, like with Laden plaster, I wouldn't know what was in all of that. Um, so I would just say with, with, with plaster or any any kind of construction, if you if you're creating some form of dust in the construction process, I'd I'd be protecting my airways. Absolutely. Thank you. In relation to imported parts, who is responsible for inspections and how are products discovered? I'm not 100% sure. I assume it'd be probably Border Force that'd be doing the inspections on imported products, same as they do with most things that are imported into Australia. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Many off peak heaters, furnace installation, etc., definitely did and definitely did um, and in, in existing heaters still do contain loose asbestos. I saw an off-peak uh, storage heater at the tip a few months ago. Does anyone want to like to comment on that? Is that a statement or a question? Um, I guess 
Yes, uh, historically they might have contained uh, different fibres. Um, the wiring was in there was coated. I would, mm -hmm. I wouldn't think any new heaters would contain that material. And um, usually it's enclosed inside the heater. You have to actually break it apart a lot to get exposed. That's my understanding. I don't know whether Mick or Duncan know more. Um, yeah, like the old heat pump style ones, they would have, yeah, most definitely contained asbestos because of, because asbestos was such a great thermal insulator. Um, yeah, it was used quite quite widely. Um, having one dumped onto a tip, yeah, it's they, they should be seen as assumed asbestos. So, yeah, the tip operator, if the person has seen it there, um, has experience in identifying asbestos or what could potentially contain asbestos, um, he yeah, could and should. I'd let the tip operator know that you know, he's got some concerns that could be a potentially asbestos containing product over there. And then it's up to the tip to handle that within their asbestos um, procedures on why they deal with asbestos. I think too, um, one of the things that we're looking at is some community education stuff around home renovation where a lot of, um, I guess, you know, like people will find old appliances and they'll pull them out, um, you know, and like you say, in those, like those old um, heat banks, you know, the off-peak heaters that have all that, they have the wadding and the lagging and all that stuff within, contained within the heater, but then someone dumps it on the tip at the face and it breaks open. I think we're trying, yeah, there, there would be a lot of building materials that um, that come out of demolitions and renovations from the general public, where there's, I think there still needs to be more awareness focus because, oh, yeah, things do just end up at the tip face in an uncontrolled manner. Thank you. Although removal is the best option, are modern paints satisfactory to contain asbestos fibres on old structures? Um, yeah, if the, if the asbestos, left, asbestos is left in situ, it's in good condition, well looked after and yeah, painted and everything like that, it's fine to be there. Um, that, that's what we say, like with that risk register I put up through the talk, a lot of that stuff through that building, it was to monitor every three, you know, two to three or five years because it was in good condition. Um, there was very little chance of it being smacked or damaged. Um, keep the paint up to it so it's actually encapsulated into it. And so that's fine. Um, just because you have asbestos in your house, or it, it doesn't mean it's drop everything, sell, sell the goat because you've got to pay to get rid of it. As long as it's in good condition, kept in good condition, yeah, there's no real great harm for it. Thank you. If asbestos is moved from a private property, are we legally required to notify neighbours? Um, if it depends on the size, once again, it gets down to if it's over 10 square metres, um, means you have to have a licensed asbestos removal to come in. And part of his licence condition is whenever he's doing a removal work, he has to have communication and notify neighbours. Um, under 10 square metres, depends on how close your neighbours are. Um, yeah, it, it'd pay to have a bit of a chat to them because if you're doing it correctly and you've got your Tyvek suit on and your mask and everything like that, and you're a metre away from your next door neighbour's fence and he's got his kids running around there playing, probably not a good look. So it'd be better off to have that conversation going, look, I'm going to get rid of a small bit of asbestos here on the back shed. Hope you don't mind. You know, if you have any concerns, just I'll let you know what's going to happen and you go for a drive for the day or something like that, if you like. Um, so just have that conversation. All right, thanks, Mick. Still talking about dust, is there a rise in silicosis in Australia? Um, I don't know the figures offhand, but I would assume there would be. Um, I can back that up. And the other thing that we're getting is that it's a much younger presentation as well. So we're getting people in their 20s and 30s, young apprentices, particularly if they're using uh, engineered stone uh, bench tops, uh, because they have a really, really high um, 
uh, silica like um, percentage um, and often um, control measures aren't always yeah like the, there's a lot more awareness because it's it's a newer understanding of that that risk there's a lot more awareness that needs to happen within the industry so um, yeah so some of the national figures I can't remember the exact figures off the top of my head but they're seeing an increase in presentation in silicosis and they see a much younger presentation than say something like um, mesothelioma All right, thank you. And our final question, have there ever been cases where a worker goes home with contaminated clothing and then family members have been affected by asbestos? Absolutely, that was with yes. the mining, absolutely, um, on the clothing, um, it was huge when they were mining it. Uh, the, the worker would take it home in their clothing, um, at home they'd wash it, dry it, shake out the clothing and absolutely got exposed and got the diseases, yes. All right, thank you. Given it's Asbestos Awareness Week, um, are there any final messages that you'd uh, like to pass on to today's uh, attendees? Just firstly for me, if that's all right, if, if you're not sure about the material, don't break into it and then wonder. Um, we get a lot of phone calls at my office that start with, um, we started renovating and then rather than looking first would be my advice. Um, absolutely make sure. Yep, yeah, um, I'll back that up. If, if, you, if you're not sure something is asbestos, assume that it is and treat it, treat it that way. Um, yeah, I know I quite often get people going, oh, chuck me a bit of spent sheet and going, do you think this is asbestos? Well, it's too late now, mate. Um, have a look at it. If you think of, yeah, if you think it's asbestos, assume it is and treat it accordingly. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just back that up as well. And I actually, yeah, I think there's some things we can actually use in our community um, education campaign, Matt. So I'm going to steal one of your lines there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah absolutely. Cause I, yeah, because <laughs> I think, I, I think, yeah, that that whole idea of just you know, assuming, yeah, people trying to work out using layperson's information rather than just asking and finding out first, and then you've got all the problems, and they're more complex uh, once you've once you've done that. So yeah, totally support that. All right, thank you very much, everyone. All right, so that brings our. That brings our webinar presentation uh, to the end. So thank you to our presenters today, Matt Gamelli from SGC Safety, Duncan Giblin from from Cancer Council Tasmania, Mick Rawlings from WorkSafe Tasmania, from <laughs> and we also had Mel Hansen uh, from WorkSafe Tasmania too. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Managing Asbestos in Workplaces. You will receive a survey following today's presentation. We do appreciate you providing us with your feedback. Today's webinar has also been recorded. On behalf of WorkSafe Tasmania, thank you for joining us. Thank you.